Sorry for keeping you waiting. Uh, we had a slight schedule change because the keynote sessions went over a little bit. So all the 11 o'clock sessions got moved to 11.30. But thank you for patiently waiting. Is everybody having fun so far? All right. You know, I have been to a lot of different conferences in my professional life, and I haven't never seen this much excitement in any other conference. Um, all due to you, our customers and partners, and you know, whatever uh, we give to you come, comes back to us manifold um, as love and excitement. Um, it's always nice to start a session uh, related to any, any product when we have a brand new announcement around it. So how many people really like the new RDS announcement today of Postgres? <laughs> Wonderful. So today, uh, we, we'll, we'll uh, look a little bit into using RDS for enterprise applications. I'll walk you through a few details of RDS. Just before going there, a uh, show of hands, how many of you are using RDS today? Wow, that's quite a few people. How many of you are planning to use RDS or currently using RDS for enterprise applications? Wonderful. And how many of you are using RDS for Oracle? Great. And RDS for SQL Server? And RDS for MySQL? All right. So we have a great group of people here. And I'm very happy to tell you today that I'm joined here by, with our, one of our uh, great customers, Select Staffing. I have Mark uh, Sainholz from Select Staffing, and I have David Brunet, our partner from DLZP Group. They will actually tell you about their experience of using RDS for powering enterprise applications. David Brunet's group, DLZP, works in implementing Oracle applications for their customers. They have worked with many applications, including PeopleSoft and JD Edwards for many of their customers and use uh, RDS for Oracle and RDS for uh, SQL Server to power most of these applications. And I'm really honored to have uh, um, Mark here from Select Staffing. Select Staffing is moving all of their enterprise applications, all of their enterprise application environments from patch and development all the way to production into AWS. And many of these are going to use RDS as well. So they'll tell you about, you know, Mark is going to tell you about their experience, you know, how did, you know, what is that they like about it and, and what kind of problems it solves for you. So let's look at some of the things that an enterprise database really needs. So when, you, when I say enterprise database, uh, many people have this notion in, in mind that uh, database that powers only prepackaged applications like Oracle eBusiness Suite or, or Siebel or, or PeopleSoft. That's all true, but there are enterprise applications that you customers build themselves. These are custom applications, which also need to have all these features when it comes to powering your enterprise applications, right? Some of the things we really look for when we build an application or when we pick a database to power an enterprise application is reliability, performance, high availability, scalability, data privacy, and security, right? Let's see how uh, RDS fares in all of these regions. When we built RDS, these are the core things that we kept in mind building it from grounds up. So reliability, uh, reliability of RDS is based on the sound principles of reliability on the rest of the AWS components are based on. Because RDS is using the same components. Your RDS is running on EC2. RDS is using EBS, right? So everything that you would use individually on AWS is the same thing RDS is using underneath. And one of the things we got started with from the very beginning is providing multi-AZ for RDS. So you can have two uh, instances running in parallel, replicating to each other providing you high availability. And scalability, there is no scalability without being able to actually go up and down, right? That's what really scalability means, not just going up. 
in, in the conventional world, actually it's kind of like a one-way street. You can really go only up, you cannot go down. And going up itself is quite a bit of work because now you have to go buy new servers, you have to install everything, you have to you know, configure everything and bring it up, probably like a month's worth of work. When it comes to RDS, it's just push button. You say, oh, today I'm running on a, a, a small instance, tomorrow I want to go on to a quadruple extra large or CR18 extra large. It's all available to you instantly. And when it comes to data security, there's nothing that we take more uh, serious at AWS than security. And, and because of the scale, the economies of scale AWS have and, and the team of engineers we have to work on this, we have the privilege to uh, really put a lot of resources into building all, the, all these components as, as secure as possible. So all the security that's available to the components of AWS, other components of AWS, are, is inherited by uh, RDS as well. This includes you know, PCC uh, compliance, um, ISO compliance, everything else that comes with all the other components. And then uh, a little while ago, we uh, made RDS available within VPC, which was one of the major asks many of our customers had. And VPC provides you the kind of security that was not available before. Uh, real enterprise class security. One other thing that VPS, uh, VPC provides you is to use or, or consider the part of the infrastructure your components are running on AWS as part of your own network. So you can use your own IP addresses. You can uh, uh, connect to this VPC using a VPN tunnel from your network. So this becomes an extension of your own network. And that is very important for most customers who are using RDS for different kind of workloads. Um, many of our customers are using RDS to power their applications for different kind of environments, including uh, dev and test and uh, you know, production copy. So when something goes wrong in production, they want to come to the, the uh, application running on AWS backed by RDS to test out their solution to see you know, how it'll fix that, that problem or the bug. This requires, again, you know, replicating data and, and making sure the data is synchronized between their uh, on-prem environment and RDS database and whatnot, right? Running this on VPC and, and connecting it is using VPN makes it like an extension of your own network, so all this can be done much easier. So, so, so far, all this is what normally people need uh, must have in, in all the enterprise class databases. Now let's see what is that people wish for in the enterprise class database. How many DBAs do we have here? We have quite a few number of DBAs. How many developers we have here? All right. So a lot of times we have seen kind of like a conflict between the developers and DBAs, right? A lot of developers will come to a DBA, you know, I want a database. And the DBA will say, you know, I'm busy with taking care of the production database. I don't have time to create this database for you. And, the, and the, the DBA is very busy with his own work, and the developers are busy with their own work. Uh, this is the time the DBA makes a prayer, you know, for that EC button to create a database, right? So that is one of the wishes that most DBAs have, most enterprises have for instant provisioning. And you take any enterprise application, one of the things the DBAs work most of the time on is cloning the database. This cloning is required for many different things, including you know, for development, for, for testing, and when we talk about testing in, in an enterprise environment, there are multiple test environments, right? The unit test environment, there is integration test environment, regression test environment, UAT environments. So all these environments need data from production. Right? So, so the database needs to be cloned multiple times. And this is, again, another wish that most of the DBAs have, most of the enterprises have, where to have an ability to instantly, easily clone the database and create multiple copies of the database. I have heard many times, even today, from one of our customers that they ran, ran out of disk space. Uh, sometimes things can sneak up on you. You run out of disk space, you, you know, you suddenly find you have so many reports running, so much new uh, workload running on your production database, everything else suddenly gets slow. And in a, 
you know, when you are running everything on-prem, now you have to go buy a much bigger server. You need to go buy a few new disks and hook everything up and connect everything, install everything, reconfigure everything. Everything takes time, and your business really suffers during that time. On RDS, it's just push-button scaling. When you are running on a smaller instance now, tomorrow you can go say, oh, I have uh, my month end closing coming or my payroll run is coming. I want to now, now scale up from my you know, M2 double extra large to M2 quadruple extra large. It's as easy as clicking a button. Then the other um, requirement or other wish that most people have is for automated backups and patching. So when it comes to RDS, actually, you know, creating databases is that easy. You know, it's just like saying, let there be databases, and, you know, you can have one, two, 25, 300, how many ever databases that you want in the way that you want it, everything pre-configured and ready to go. And all the DBAs know there are, when it comes to creating databases and configuring databases, there's a, there are a lot of best practices that goes into making it the right way, right? When it comes to RDS, all those best practices are already built into it. So this includes the best practices for that particular platform, where it is Oracle or SQL Server, whatever it is, as well as the best practices for doing things on AWS. So you don't have to worry about, you know, what should I tweak, how should I configure this, what should I do to get the perform best performance out of it. One other great thing that AWS provides and RDS provides is the, the global footprint we have, right? We have nine regions. So now just sitting at your desk, you can create a database in Singapore. You don't have to be, you know, locked into just your server running in your, in your own data center. And this becomes very important depending on what kind of business you have. You, maybe you have a bunch of developers here in your U.S. location and you have outsourced a bunch of development work for in some company in India or, or in the Philippines. So probably it'll be better for them for you know, low latency and quick access to the database if the data, they have a copy of database for development that is closer to them. Or you might be serving a lot of global clientele in your business all across the world. You, know, you, you started in US, you grew, you, now you have operations across the globe in multiple places. You probably want to replicate data closer to wherever your customers are, right? Now you can just sit at your desk and do create this replica or your database in any of the regions that you want, any time you want. And actually, to add to that, we just recently uh, released a new feature for RDS for uh, cross-region snapshot copy. So now you can create a snapshot and move it over to another region and set up a new database there in no time. I, I mentioned to you this a couple of times. You know, I just, I just want... The, the reason I'm repeating this multiple times is because I want you to carry this with you. A lot of times what happens is we come from a world where we are used to doing things in a particular way, and we tend to continue to do it in, in that way even when there are other facilities available, right? Keep in mind the scale up and down. And the scale up and down is possible at the instance level, and scale up is possible in the, in the data size level. Now, you, you can start with a 5 gigabyte database, and two days later, you can go to a 3 terabyte database, right? There's nothing really holding you back. You can start off with the smallest instance possible. You can go to the largest instance possible and come back to the smallest instance. And so, so you have to kind of, like, Think out of the box depending on the kind of workload th that you have. I, I did a session yesterday on migrating data to RDS. So one of the things I was uh, suggesting customers do is when you're migrating data, that's a lot of workload suddenly on your database, right? So you want to have the largest possible instance type when you are doing that. So just go to the largest possible instance type. Migrate all the data. Let's say the data migration takes six hours. When it is all done, you can come back to wherever you were before. And the, since these are not things that you are used to doing in your, when the database is on-prem, people kind of like overlook it and forget it. So keep in mind the scalability that is available to you. And the same thing also applies to you know, IOPS that's a, that are available. You can pick and choose how many IOPS that you want for your database. I, I, I was... 
uh, working on a little, uh, doing something on MySQL for another presentation a few months ago, and I wanted to see how I can set up a replica, I have a slave to uh, do you know, real-time replication into that database. It took me over eight hours to set this whole thing up, and there were like 141 different steps to go through to set up the whole thing, test it out, and make sure it is working. Um, how, how long does it take it if you do it on RDS? Anybody? It's just a checkbox. When you create a database, you mark a checkbox saying you want multi-AZ. Say multi-AZ, you have high availability available. You have you know, a replica available already. And what, if you have, want to have other replicas, it's again as easy as you know, creating a snapshot. Once you create a snapshot, you can create a database from that snapshot. Then you can create you know, multiple databases from the same snapshot as your you know, workload requires. This is a slide that I, I made a few days ago. You can see you know, I'm missing one logo in there, uh, Postgres, which we announced today. So we have the four most popular database engines available on RDS. So this covers pretty much, I would say, 99% of all the enterprise application needs that, that people use enterprise application with, whether it is PeopleSoft or JD Edwards or, or Cbell. You can, you can power it to Oracle IDS or SQL Server IDS. And if you are using some of the other open source enterprise class applications like Sugar CRM or Alfresco or something of that nature, obviously MySQL or Postgres. Let me just uh, run through some of the features that we, we uh, announced recently, just in case if you guys missed any of this. We, till a few months ago, the largest database size you could have for RDS was one terabyte. So we moved it up from one terabyte to three terabytes. Now, in all these engines, you can go from you know, up to three terabytes for the database size. And now we have the largest instance type, which is CR1, eight extra large, with 244 gigs of memory available in RDS. So, you know, pretty much there is no limit when it comes to the, the kind of database engine available to power your application. Uh, when it comes to Oracle, this is one of the very frequent asks we had from our customers to enable stats pack. So we have stats pack available so the DBAs can see how the database is performing and, you know, figure out if there is any contention, you know, how the queries are performing and tune the database accordingly. Uh, we have newly introduced data migration capabilities for uh, MySQL when, with the upgrade to 5.6. With 5.6, there are a few new things that, that are available, including memcache and binary, logs ac binary log access. So with the bin log access, now you can even synchronize your MySQL database with the, your on-prem database. You have a bunch of database on-prem, you can synchronize you know, both ways. And on the security side, we have made TDE available on Oracle RDS. So now you can, you can encrypt your data at, at rest on Oracle RDS. Two days ago, we all uh, rolled this out for MySQL as well. So for MySQL, for, for MySQL and uh, Oracle, I'm sorry, for SQL Server and Oracle RDS, now TDE is available as one of the features. So from, from the things that I told you so far, I covered two things, right? I covered both the enterprise database needs and the enterprise database wants or wishes. So enterprise database needs is what your current databases on-prem or in your data center is providing you, which is completely, RDS completely covers all those things when it comes to the enterprise class database. In addition to that, RDS covers all these enterprise database class wishes as well, which is the wish of the DBAs and the developers and the management, right? So you don't have to go run, buy new disks or buy new servers, scale up and down as you want. And it all comes at a very affordable cost, uh, cutting down a lot of really mundane, redundant tasks like you know, backups and, and minor patches and whatnot. So all these things can be automated. You can automate backups. You can automate snapshots. And in the regular AWS fashion, everything that can do with RDS is available as an API. So you don't even have to go to the console to do these things, right? So you, let's say you want 
Every night you want uh, the data to be replicated to Singapore region and create a replica of the database there for the developers in the APAC region to, to work with, or you want to replicate the data to like Brazil for reports to run there. You don't have to do this manually every day. You can just write a tiny little cloud formation script which gets kicked off by a cron job and goes and does this for you. So these are some of the, uh, some of the products, some of the enterprise class products our customers are using on AWS with RDS as the database engine. That you can see it includes many of the very popular enterprise class applications, including PeopleSoft, JD Edwards, Siebel, and ATG WebCommerce. As I told you before, you know, People use this for different things. Some people use this for all the way um, dev, test, and production. Some people use it for dev and test, and, and they use their own you know, managed database on EC2 for production. Or some people run dev and test on AWS using RDS and you know, do their production in-house. Uh, one place where RDS might not be a good fit for your enterprise application is if your application, the, the amount of data that you have is larger than three terabytes, right? Obviously, I told you the largest database size you can have is three terabytes. So if your production database is six terabytes, RDS obviously won't fit your need. But even for that environment, when it comes to dev and test and everything else, you are not going to have all the data as you have production in, in those environments. Right? So again, that is where RDS fits in in that picture. And in some cases where you, your application actually needs sys and system level access for the database, which is not available with RDS because it's a managed database, again, RDS might not be the best fit. So an application, an example for that will be eBusiness Suite. Uh, other than these kind of applications, I would say RDS should be the first thing you should be looking at when picking the database to power your enterprise application. Now to tell, about, tell us about you know, their experience of using RDS to implement enterprise applications for the customers, I'd like to invite David Brunet from DLZP Group. Has it worked? Has it worked? Yeah. Perfect. All right, everyone. Well, uh, thank you for coming to the session. I really appreciate it. Uh, just to talk a little bit about my company, uh, we are uh, an Oracle partner and an Amazon implementation partner, uh, specialized in deploying uh, Oracle apps into Amazon Cloud. Um, we started the company in 2011. Um, you know, as a former Oracle employee, you know, one of the things I saw with the market was that the need for companies to start looking at cloud as the solution for hosting their enterprise apps. And so we started the company with the whole premise of, you know, let's do a consulting as a service with a software as a service type model. Uh, and so we've been focused on you know, helping companies move uh, or implement PeopleSoft applications specifically into the Amazon's cloud. <clears throat> uh, we are a founding member of the test drive program as well. So you, you actually, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, what I want to talk about today is just kind of give you an overview of the, what type of architecture we implement for uh, PeopleSoft on the AWS cloud. <clears throat> Um, and just you know, kind of give you an idea of how we deploy it, uh, taking advantage of all the pieces, uh, components that Amazon provides, uh, and, and stitching them together to provide the, a, a solution for our clients. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the use cases we have. Uh, we have clients that do different things, and so I'll give you some ideas of you know, how our, our clients are using it differently than what we originally uh, envisioned it to do. Uh, and then we'll just go over uh, a typical project plan uh, for the migration onto the AWS cloud. <clears throat> um, so the first thing is uh, the architecture. Uh, so this diagram just points out all the individual component parts that we use with AWS uh, and how they come together to form you know, a high availability PeopleSoft implementation. Uh, the real beauty of this is that it scales from a small customer. We have customers that have 10 users of PeopleSoft deployed in Amazon's cloud. Okay, those of you who use PeopleSoft, like, can't imagine a company with 10 employees using PeopleSoft, but we, do, we have done that. And all we've done is taken all those servers and scaled them down to a much smaller size, uh, and it's very cost effective. <clears throat> and they get the same architecture that you know, much larger organizations spend hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars to accomplish. Uh, so we take advantage of Route 53 on the front end for the DNS entries tracking. 
Uh, we take advantage of the elastic load balancers for you know, balancing the tra incoming traffic. <coughs> uh, the web servers, uh, we use you know, auto scaling to scale them up as you know, uh, you know, people start coming in and using uh, <coughs> them and, you know, and, and, use, and actually you know, once they reach a certain point of usage, you know, it launches a new instance so that they can you know, balance it across multiple servers. Uh, and we've broken out all the individual components onto their own separate EC2 instances. Uh, this allows us to basically throw away the instances. So when we need to upgrade uh, or apply patches, we can insert one of those new servers patched up into the combination and validate that everything is working successfully for us. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, important piece is the file server. Uh, we take you know, all the files that are generated by PeopleSoft, we store them on a centralized file server, and that server is backed up to S3. Um, so that we get you know, uh, that information stored and saved, uh, and, and the app servers and batch process schedulers are also uh, on their own separate instances. <clears throat> so it makes it real easy to scale and to manage, and like I said, if something goes wrong, we can easily fire up a new instance uh, in no time at all. And we've been able to use CloudFormation to, to script this so that anytime we get a new customer, rather than you know, taking weeks and days uh, to try and deploy a new instance for them. As soon as they sign our contract, we got a demo instance up and running for them, we got their test instance up and running, and we got their production instance up and running within a matter of hours, uh, which is, you know, in my world, it's an incredible uh, advantage uh, because that means my team, when they go in to start the implementation, they have everything in place already with no, no, no latency in terms of the starting the implementation. Uh, and then, of course, the big important piece is the RDS servers at the back. Uh, you know, this whole session is about the RDS. Uh, that's just great because now we don't need to worry about uh, managing, getting new instances up and running. Uh, it makes it so simple to create a copy of prod into dev or into test. You know, so if a developer says, okay, something's broken in production, within an hour we can have a copy of production already staged and copied down into the test environment <coughs> for debugging. So, so this is, you know, uh, the architecture, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward, and you know, much of the knowledge in that that's been gained through the years of you know, how to fail over and protect yourself uh, from bad things uh, you know, is covered in it. Uh, and the failover, you can do it in the same zone or across multiple zones uh, if you like. Talking about the use cases, uh, so the first one is the obvious one. Uh, we're doing production instances uh, and dev and test instances. Uh, we also do disaster recovery uh, on the AWS. And then the other one uh, that we've got a large customer, they're one of the largest Oracle training companies, uh, we built the dashboard for them uh, through our website that allows them to start and schedule their trainings. So every student that goes through their training gets their own private PeopleSoft instance <coughs> or Oracle application. We do it for eBusiness, we do business, uh, OBIE, uh, the different products, but they're able to actually schedule the instances, start them up, they start, you know, a break. last week they started 250 instances. So we're doing about 100 terabytes of a week of, you know, starting and stopping uh, PeopleSoft Oracle application instances weekly, <coughs> which is, uh, you know, incredible. I never thought I'd be up here saying I've been using it 100 terabytes a week uh, in data, but, uh, you know, Amazon's allowed us to do that for this customer. Um, when we deploy, you know, my favorite customers are the new implementations. Uh, net new PeopleSoft customers uh, because, you know, we don't have to deal with a lot of legacy stuff. You know, it's basically we take our cookbook and we say this is what you get and this is the way it's configured and there's no real discussion about it. It's, that's the way it is. Um, so we've implemented all the best practices in that infrastructure. Uh, so we can do that within 24 hours, like I said. Uh, but when you're talking about, you know, migration from an on-premise solution, well, now you've got to deal with the legacy history. Right, so you got to start thinking about, well, okay, well, here's the way we recommend do it, but, oh, you've configured your system a certain way, and so some of that stuff has to carry forward for various reasons. <clears throat> um, and so you could end up with restrictions based on what you've done internally or in the past history. So that's one thing to think about that makes it a little more challenging. Uh, but, you know, you can start applying the best practices as you're migrating over, and over time you can, you know, move yourself to know, the more ideal infrastructure and take advantage of the 
uh, what's available on the Amazon cloud. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's a longer timeline to migrate because now you're dealing with migration of huge amounts of databases uh, you know, that you want to keep maintain and keep for going forward. <coughs> um, so we offer a proof of concept service to our clients. So we try and do this in you know, two-week increments uh, where we will take you know, a copy of one of your instances, you know, production environments, maybe a dev, and we'll copy it into Amazon's cloud for you and then show you how it works and then use that as kind of foundation to iterate to the time we get you into production. Um, and no, the beauty of doing a proof of concept is it allows you to experiment and you know, to test different scenarios. You now maybe we do bigger app servers and smaller web servers, or we do you know, much larger process schedule servers. So we try and you know, use some of your use cases internally uh, to run through and make sure that we're getting the right combination of components for you, because everyone is slightly different in the way they use the application. Uh, and the way it behaves in their data center. So when you're embarking on a project to actually move to Amazon's cloud, uh, this is kind of the simple, simplified uh, project plan. Uh, you know, you start, you go to Amazon, you set up a VPC. Uh, you want to do that right up front. That's, uh, you know, for yourself, that's secure, uh, ensures that, you know, everything's protected as best as possible. Uh, then you, we would create the foundational infrastructure. Uh, which are the web app process scheduler and DB servers. And again, a lot of that stuff we have templated uh, already, so we can just use our templates and then apply uh, the changes from your environment into that. <coughs> um, then the next step is to copy your database into Amazon Cloud. Um, you know, we would then complete the configuration based on your database um, configuration. And then we would release it to the client to test the environment as well as the application. So make sure that our developers can still get in, do what they need to do, and that the application actually performs um, to a level of uh, satisfaction that the client expects. <clears throat> uh, and then we would do this a couple more times, uh, a couple iterations, and we'll get through the process until we do the final move of the production. So we've done you know, some moves in as little as six weeks, others 12, and depending on you know, the environment you know, could take longer as well. Uh, the complexity of the client environment. Um, some of the major challenges um, of migrating uh, is actually the, the database is probably the biggest. Uh, you know, if you got a 30 gigabyte database, no problem that you can FTP up and that'll be done in a couple hours, no big deal. But if you start dealing with one terabyte ter databases, well now you have to start applying uh, some best practices in the way to migrate that up to the cloud. You have to start thinking about, well, how do we keep it in sync? during the time that it's moving up into the cloud, because you, when you transition, you want to have no, as minimal downtime as possible between the time you say, okay, we're stopping production and we're going live in Amazon. So uh, you got to really put a lot of thought about behind that, and you know, the size of the database will really impact how you approach that. <coughs> uh, customization, so if you've heavily customized your application, that introduces a, another factor into um, you know, in the way you can deploy, because if you didn't follow best practices, or you know, we may encounter certain things that you know work in your data center, but then when we get to the cloud, oh, it's not behaving the same way anymore because of the virtualized environment potentially, or things like that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, be careful of that. Uh, and then what we're finding is that if you have other resources that aren't really part of the core Oracle application, but are things you built to add on, then you have to start thinking about those as well. So you got your you know, uh, Active Directory servers, you maybe have some additional file servers, maybe you have some other applications that integrate to PeopleSoft, and you're saying, well, it's a small application, I can move that to the cloud as well. So that adds complexity to the project, but also adds opportunity for the client to actually bring more stuff up. <clears throat> and then, you know, the traditional thing is just making sure that you have a team available to do the testing uh, and, you know, the follow-up in that. So that, that's the standard project challenge of any project, I suspect. So, you know, the benefits we're finding uh, for customers um, are many of these. I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but the biggest one for me is the reduced implementation timeline, uh, which directly translates into reduced cost to my clients in terms of us being able to deploy PeopleSoft for them. Uh, you know, I save about 15 to 20 percent of the cost of an implementation for our clients just by using AWS because we get rid of a whole slew of work that usually would add time to the project. 
um, you know, as far as the scalability, uh, you know, we can scale the instances as they grow or down as they, you know, uh, shrink. <coughs> um, we've, you know, repeatability for us is very important. And we want to be able to do this consistently and repetitively so that, you know, every customer that we do, we get, per, you know, incrementally better with each implementation so that, you know, again, we reduce the cost to the client. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, you know, just before I finish up, you know, some of the things to think about, uh, get your VPC up and running first. Uh, you know, you know, if you don't do it first, then there's, there's quite a bit of work involved in, you know, rebuilding everything and moving into VPC. Um, <coughs> you know, Amazon RDS and EBS optimized volumes, you know, look at doing that, you know, leverage uh, that as much as possible. <coughs> um, you know, and then think about the ports and security required. One of the things is, is everything that you do on Amazon is secured by default. So every port is blocked on your Windows servers or Unix servers, so you have to unblock each port individually. So when you're in, enabling something like Active Directory, you need to unblock port 445 or whatever port is necessary. So you have to start thinking about things like that. <coughs> Um, and then just you know, start thinking about the other applications that you need to use with your enterprise app. So when you're moving, you know, you got, you know, you got the core enterprise app that may be the target, but then there's all these incremental stuff, items that you have to start thinking about and, and potentially you know, include those in the migration. And most of that is relatively easy to do as well. Um, from here, uh, just before I hand it over to Mark, uh, we do have a test drive lab. Uh, we were one of the founding members of the test drive program with Amazon. Uh, you can log on to either Amazon site or our site, and you can actually go and start a copy of PeopleSoft Financials or HCM and run it for five hours for free to play with it and get, kind of get a feel of what it's like to run on Amazon's cloud. Um, so, be Mark. <coughs> oh. Head over to Mark to take over and talk about his customer experience on it. Thank you, David. All right. Trying to get my Star Trek video queued up here, but it doesn't seem to be working. Just kidding. Um, thank you all for uh, sticking with me here. The, uh, we are uh, part of select staffing. Um, the Get back on my slide here. The uh, part of select staffing here, uh, we're one of the largest staffing companies in the United States. Uh, we've got 400 offices across the country and uh, been in business for quite some time, for uh, 20 plus years, uh, we're based in Santa Barbara, California. And that's where we have our uh, data center. And therein lies our challenge, is we have a data center that hosts PeopleSoft. And while a lot of you, you're out there, you probably have the same thing, that's why you're here hopefully, you know, that is a challenge for us because, you know, we're experts at staffing. We're not experts at running data centers. And to have the staff and the experience and the talent and to retain that to continuously manage a data center, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. I'm sure you guys probably would agree with that. So we have... Uh, I keep looking down at my mic and um, looking at the uh, internal infrastructure challenges we have. Um, many of you who have ERP systems, ours is going on five years old. So, you know, we set up, we set about having a system. You, you do your due diligence, you provision X number of servers of a certain size based upon what you expect that data to be. And, but you don't really know what's going to happen with your environments five years from now, from when you first started. So, you know, one of our challenges is that we're starting to outgrow our servers, starting to outgrow our disks, and, and it's also getting old. Things fail. You guys, I'm sure, have had uh, some issues of your own along the way, but uh, it's expected. It's, it's equipment, it's hardware. You're bound to have that. But sometimes... Uh, it can be more challenging to recover from those because ERP systems are mission critical and you know, they are the backbones of an organization that allow the processes to go through and you know, basically counting all the, uh, the dollars for your organization. And so 
it's not as sexy as video streaming or half these other presentations you might see, but it's mission critical, and I think it's something that uh, you know, all of you in here are probably very close to if you're at this presentation, and uh, it hopefully will speak to you. So one of our needs is uh, making sure that our infrastructure, as it ages and as it, uh, we work through replacing equipment and, and having failures, is that we can have a more reliable infrastructure. So that's one of our uh, challenges and one of our goals with uh, moving to AWS. Um, another challenge we have is setting up a reliable disaster recovery and failover solution. Um, you know, we have challenges supporting our production environment, and you know, on top of that, trying to uh, set up failover, automated failover, and uh, sending our replicated database, you know, doing some log shipping over to our DR site. You know, sometimes that takes a back seat and is not as uh, reliable uh, that we would like to see. So AWS is one of those, uh, has one of those, uh, it's one of our goals for going there is to help combat that issue of uh, having challenges with our DR and our failover. And the, the other thing goes back to the cost. Again, you start out building an ERP system. Uh, you, you say, well, I need X number of servers. I need a SAN. I need this. I need that. And you buy it. And then five years later, you need to replace it all. So you know, I don't know how many of you shop for SANs, but they're not cheap. And you know, how, much, how do you know how much data you're going to need five years from now even? So you, you know, you've got that sizing part of the equation. You've got the cost equation. And also, you have the budgeting, planning, going through the executives to see, you know, will you give me thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a new SAN for our dev environment? You know, what's the uh, likely answer there? So those are some of the challenges that uh, we've had. We've wanted to nip in the bud with our move to AWS. And so we are currently in that transition still, and we've got our environments there, and we're working with them at AWS. And uh, one of the challenges I just wanted to highlight that uh, some of you guys might have along the way is, you know, we're locked into a certain version of Oracle and PeopleSoft that we've been working on for a couple of years. And for various reasons, we haven't upgraded. We're heavily customized. We've got data migrations and transitions that are ongoing. So, you know, we're stuck on tools version. We're on Oracle 10G. Well, in order to move to RDS, we want to be on 11G. They support 11G. And while that's not, uh, you know, it's not a big deal to upgrade a database. You do have to make sure it's compatible with your level of tools. You got to go through thorough testing to ensure that uh, you know, your code works with the upgraded version, obviously. So that's just been a challenge to work through the actual uh, testing phase of that um, part of the project. So the other uh, thing that uh, David actually alluded to, uh, we've had a challenge with is uh, the data size and uh, because our infrastructure is a bit antiquated and not the fastest, you know, we've got one terabyte databases that, you know, taking a backup of those, zip, compressing, zipping it up, sending it across the network, and it takes some time. And so one of our challenges uh, planning for uh, the final cutover in a few weeks has been to go with a uh, tool that helps replicate that process and keeps the data in sync. So it's been an a interesting challenge to go through, and it's something that uh, just want to be aware of if you have a large data size. But some of the uh, benefits that we're hoping to gain and that we are gaining from this is the ability to size our environments as we need them. Now, it's been an exercise that you want to take on with testing and performance tuning because you don't know how do you know what size server you need before you get there? And so part of the process is you know, running your, your payroll processes, your confirms, your calcs, your, your batch posting jobs, and, and making sure that uh, they're running in a performance that you expect them to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So and to that, you know, here, here's an example of a, of a benefit that we have with RDS. I'm sorry, with AWS in particular is uh, the sizing of our uh, Windows servers in our PeopleSoft environment. You know, we, when we first started out, we thought there, you know, we need to have our Windows servers be same size as our 
uh, Unix servers, and so we've bought these big beefy servers, and and you know find out you know into the implementation that we barely use those. So we've just spent you know thousands and thousands of dollars on these oversized servers that you know, we can't give back. So uh, benefit of AWS is you know we can very easily just you know dial down the size in a few clicks, and it's something that uh, um, you know with not just Windows servers, but any kind of servers, any kind of resources as part of your environment. That's one of the uh, uh, benefits of working with AWS and one of the uh, um, things that we really like about it. <clears throat> so uh, again, and that goes back to a cost factor too, because if you're not using a server, well, you don't have to pay for it. And, uh, <laughs> and we're able to, if you do need more of a server, you're able to scale out without uh, having to go through uh, any capital expenditure, approval processes, and uh, you can instantaneous, almost instantaneously uh, gain those resources. Uh, it also gives you a greater flexibility in setting up your test and QA environments, and that's one of the beauties of RDS here, is that uh, we have the ability to clone a copy of our production environment directly into a test database uh, without much effort, a couple clicks, and you're done, and, this would uh, be very helpful uh, in a number of instances in our current environment where we need to test a production issue. I'm sure you've all been there. Something's going wrong in production and you want to just get a copy of it and test it in a lower environment. And uh, so this RDS uh, gives you that ability to do that uh, very rapidly and uh, very effectively. So I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. And uh, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to come see me or turn it over to Bill. Thank you very much. Why don't you stay here if people have some questions? David as well. Thank you both, uh, Mark and David. Uh, um, now you actually heard it from the customer them, um, themselves on how they are using it. So you know, it'll be an example of how you can use it yourself. Um, if you haven't used RDS already, I would suggest you go to the RDS uh, AWS webpage. There's a free tier. You can spin up an RDS instance and get started on it quickly for 750 hours. You don't pay anything, so you can try it out. And also, it's the Test Drive Labs, um, awstestdrive.com. Um, DLZP also bought, uh, built a bunch of test drives, so that it gives you an environment for you know, a few hours powered by, with RDS and, and uh, um, so some of these databases for you to play around and figure out how things work. So now we are open for questions. We have a little bit of time left in the session. So if anybody has questions, I'd uh, request you step up to the microphone there and ask us the question. And also, please give your feedback on the session. You can, if you have already downloaded the mobile app, you can do it directly from the mobile app. There is a survey uh, button on in there icon. Just click on the survey icon and give us your feedback. So you know we can depending on how you liked it, what you liked it, we can improve these sessions even further when it comes to next year. Thank you very much.